I've been doing, we have been doing um, more intimate uh, legislative updates, but still there's not a whole bunch going on at the Capitol these days. However, I'd say this week there was a little bit more going on. Um, for those of us who are new to the organization, I just want to say good afternoon uh, and thanks so much for joining us at Secular AZ today. We are a 5013C3 organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade now. Uh, today, we're going to be getting a legislative update from a member from the House and the Senate. Uh, so Representative Sarah Liguori from uh, LD28, uh, now the new, she's in five now, running for a seat uh, at the House again, and Senator Raquel Tehran, who is a representative, or I'm sorry, a senator from LD30, and I'm not sure what her new district number is, but she'll be able to tell us. She's also head of the Arizona Democratic Party. So I just wanted to open up today um, to talk about recent national events uh, as they relate to Arizona. Um, we've seen two mass shootings here in the United States um, over the last, what, 14 days now. Um, I think there was even another one in between. I read a statistic that we, uh, it's the 147th day of the year and we've had 212 mass shootings. 212. It's the only country where this happens. And, um, you know, the crazy thing about it for me was like, I, uh, I read it, I, I read something on Twitter, and it said two people at, at a school in Texas, that was the first report that came out. And it, and I feel like I've become so desensitized to these acts happening that I was like, Oh, well, two people, that's, that's not bad. That's fine, which just goes to show how we're all so numb to this incident happening. And then of course, you know, we saw as the numbers climbed and 19 children and two teachers, um, two teachers protect, protecting their children, protecting their students. Um, and then, and then I even saw yesterday that one of the teacher's husbands died of a heart attack. Um, and it just made me think about how the whole community has changed forever, how that entire family, they leave behind four children, um, just shattered. And um, as a teacher myself for many years, I um, have participated uh, in lockdowns, whether they were drills or the real thing, you know, pulling kids into my classroom. Um, if they were in the hallway, locking the door, putting something over the window so nobody could see, making sure all my students were in the farthest part away from the windows and ready to put myself in front of them. And so the attacks on teachers right now, I think particularly are just, that's why they're even so much more offensive because I don't know one single teacher who wouldn't put their life on the line for their students. And when we do these lockdowns and when we, when we have active shooters on our campus, that's what we do. We're not there grooming or indoctrinating or taking advantage of or somehow trying to hurt children. We, we love them and that's why we teach. So um, I see that Senator Tehran is here and we can talk about this a little bit more because um, uh, uh, minority leader uh, in the Senate, Rebecca Rios, Senator Rios gave a, a really moving speech. And I watched it yesterday because I wasn't able to the other day. And the, some of the reactions coming from the senators were loathsome. They were downright dangerous in some of the rhetoric. Um, Senator Rick Gray, in fact, blamed atheists for mass shootings um, and said that what we need is more prayer in schools. Um, Senator Townsend said what we need to do is arm teachers. And this is so, the hypocrisy is just rich with this one because at the same time in the House, they were debating SB 1412 which would not allow teachers to teach an accurate history. It's an anti-CRT bill and they've expanded it to community colleges and public universities in Arizona. I can't admit, you know, I didn't learn about the Tulsa massacre until I went to college, which is an injustice to everybody in the United States for not, for not learning about that. We should all have that in our curriculum. And if it does make us feel bad, well, we should. <laughs> We may not have been the perpetrators of that, but we should all feel bad, no matter what our race, ethnicity, 
uh, country of origin is, we should all feel bad about that. And we should all do better so it never happens again. So I'm going to go ahead and let our guest, our first guest today, Senator Tehran, Go ahead and, and introduce yourself. I'm so happy to see you, Raquel. Thank you so much for coming with us today. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, uh, everybody, for having me here. I, I, I could hear your emotion, and I'm with you, frankly. It was such, it's been such a terrible week. Um, you know, this week when we, we were going into the floor when we, we got the news and Oh my gosh, to see the lack of, of reaction. And honestly, I wish I would have start. I don't know why I froze. I would have, I would have like stopped the floor. And I, I'm like, how in the world can we be even conducting business when we have this news in front of us? Uh, why, how, how can you just like pray silently and not show any reaction to a fact that 15 children had, had died. And it's, I think it speaks to, to the disconnect that, that my colleagues from the other side of the aisle have, frankly. And, and, and maybe it's not only them, right? It's the whole country that has become uh, so numb sometimes with these type of incidents. I'm like, as a mother, you know, I am heartbroken and I'm, I'm heartbroken for the, for the loss of, of for the families uh, who lost their children and and the entire community and uh, but as a legislator i'm just i'm enraged i'm i'm in, in, enraged just I, i'm frustrated and to hear republicans not only here but all over the country uh be so out of touch with the with the issues at, at the hand at, at a hand and, and is frustrating beyond words as you can see you're catching me fresh off very fresh. And um, I, I honestly, I haven't even spoken on the floor yet because I've been so frustrated that this is how I've been, I've been feeling. And, and here, I mean, in, in Arizona, our governor, you know, tweets out his thoughts and prayers, but has, I mean, they then signed pieces of legislation protecting guns instead of children. And I mean, um, you know, I remember, <laughs> I remember too, I don't, I don't know if it's a committee that you sit in or if it maybe is Senator Quesada, but there was a bill that would, yeah. uh, that gave protections to uh, um, companies that sell guns or, or have some yeah. kind of business, yeah. shooting ranges, whatever, yeah. and that, that insurance companies could not make uh, they, they couldn't discriminate against those businesses. And to hear Senator yeah. Townsend mm -hmm. talk about guns and in a way, I mean, she values weapons more than the lives of people, than yeah. people's bodily autonomy, than the, the treatment of teachers, you know, and for her to say, yeah. we need to arm teachers while at the very same time, they're yeah. telling us that we are not good at our jobs. Yeah. And, and what, that's right. Who do they think oh. is going to teach the children or, or do they just not care? They and that's that's the frustrating thing, right? Like, and then you hear the right and the left Republicans and Democrats. I'm like, that's a false equivalency. That is such a false equivalency. Like when you have, yeah, to your point of all these bills that come in front of us and get signed by the governor, Second Amendment sanctuary state. What about making uh, our state a sanctuary for, for children? Uh, and so we all know, I mean, that it's because the NRA has their hands and, and, and deep in the, in the pockets of all these Republican politicians. That's, that's a reality, that's a reality. So when I sat there on the floor, uh, the, the, the day after the shooting on Wednesday, and uh, we came ready, like you, you, you said it right, like, Senator Rios, leader Rios came in with a best speech, was very clear like at the end of that we need to work on, on common sense, uh, gun law reform. I mean, and uh, I mean, their reaction was just alarming, you know, to sit there and listen to, to uh, blame, to, 
to hear Republicans blame teachers and hear blame on the lack of religion and also transgender children. That was the other piece that they tried to make. So those same Republicans have like spent time, spent so many years uh, demonizing our teachers, leading parents to believe that they can't be trusted. Now they expect our teachers to take up arms and add security guards to their job description. So that is not, I don't believe, we don't believe as Democrats, that's the, the way forward. And uh, so we, I think we're, we're ready, we're ready to, to fight. And, you know, start, I, I said something right now that, you know, I, you know, people, people are starting to, to see these incidents as, as norm and, and, and there's some kind of numbness and this is going to be our moment and you all here as community leaders in an organization that takes stances, we are at a moment where we have to continue to push. And I understand that it's so tiring. I know we have so many, we're being hit left and right. We're hitting, being hit with the lack of gun, gun reform that we're seeing in front of us. We're being hit with the fact that our schools are underfunded with abortion access uh, being taken away uh, in denial of climate change. The fact that there's, there's like this, this frustration of inaction, right? And especially, it's even more frustrating. And I think that I feel more frustrated being so close to majorities, being that we are two seats, two, two votes, two votes from getting good policy moving forward in the House, two votes from getting policy moving forward in the Senate. So uh, I have to take a breather and, uh, and, and, and always remind ourselves that we're, we're, we're building and this moment and these extreme agendas is the fact that Republicans are betting on, on setting an extreme agenda to mobilize their base. But we also have to remind ourselves that we've created an infrastructure here in the state of Arizona that ultimately has gotten us to become a battleground state. So the action of all this extreme agenda, anti-democracy, anti-choice, anti-science, anti-everything that they can push is because we're organizing. So the hardest thing that we have in front of us is going back into our communities and making sure that they feel the agitation that we need to turn out in big numbers. And I know, I know, like, trust me, I, I know that elections is not the be all, the end all of everything. But, but this, this year, this year could be the last year of a healthy democracy if we don't turn out. So um, you all also know, uh, and, and, and Jeannie, let me know if you don't want me, like how much we, we can talk partisan here because I'm awful, always mindful of legality, C3, C4 and all that. Sure, sure. No, I mean, and we are, we are a nonpartisan organization. But we also, there are issues that we can get behind. So yeah, when, yeah. you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, I mean, to be quite frank, the issues that, that we care about, like the separation of yeah. church and state, bodily autonomy, anything that stems from this religious right movement, unfortunately, it does seem to be coming from one party. And you are yeah. here as the leader of the Democratic Party. Okay. So yeah. you're, you're welcome to at least share, yeah. you know, because I know yeah. people want to put their their angst, their frustration yeah. um, into action. So help them do that. So no, no. Okay. So, so uh, just with my, so that's with my legislator hat on, right? The frustration that we hear of being so close to being in majorities in both chambers and with having good policy that doesn't move forward because majority is unwilling to work with us. So we have, even like right now with a budget, they don't have, they can't get their 31 Republicans in the House and their 16 Republicans in the Senate and them all together with their governor to pass a good, a good, um, a good budget. So it's so frustrating to see their unwillingness to negotiate. So we have that piece. So being mindful of those piece of that extreme agenda that we're seeing moved at the, in the legislature, I'm reminded that we have an infrastructure and it's not only the Arizona Democratic Party, it's the movement building organizations that have worked so hard over the years, like Mi Familia Vota, Lucha, 
uh, one Arizona, Arizona wins. They've worked so hard. And those are just examples of some of the organizations. They work really hard to expand the electorate, right? To expand and, and connect with voters like Latino voters and black indigenous communities who who tend to vote progressive and, and we can't, but we can't take them for granted, but they have been working really hard to engage uh, those organizations. And then you have, you have the unions and you have Planned Parenthood. So we're all, we are the strongest that we can be and we're fighting back. The only thing is that we're getting hit left and right. So at the end of the day, um, I, I come in with my organizer hat on and believe that the best way for us to ensure that next year, that this election year, that in November, in in a few months, because it's just a few months, in 40, 40 days, people are going to be receiving the ballots for the primary. Think about that. It's 40 days before from when they receive the ballots for the primary. So in a blink of an eye, we'll be receiving the ballots for the general election. So there is no time to waste. There is Mission for Arizona that is all over the state, working all over the state. That's a coordinated campaign for the party that's connecting in every corner to make sure that people are turning out and that people, I, I know like even though it's easy to feel like us, that we feel tired and we feel agitated and sometimes don't know, know where to turn, voters are also feeling like that. So having organizers on the ground, connecting with people, listening to their issues, listening to what they care about is extremely, is extremely important. So I'm really proud that we are already on the ground. This is gonna be a, a turn, it, it, this election is gonna be about turnout, um, but we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity because although the Independent Redistricting Commission was uh, the redistricting commission process was a challenge uh, in general. There was a pathway to majorities here in, in Arizona. So we are betting on, 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 on continuing to win majorities at our state legislature. We have an opportunity to get the governor seat to, to maintain the secretary of state. And I, I have a lot of conversation with folks at a national level. I'm really making the case for that Secretary of State, all of the all of the statewide seats. But I remind folks, you know, that in 2024, the person who's going to certify that election is 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 the Secretary of State, and that person can be Mark Fincham if we don't get out of vote. That person was Mark Fincham was at the insurrection. So what do we want? So we have all of all of this agitation to go out and, and organize and we're ready. We're ready to meet that challenge. I'm confident with the infrastructure that the party has. I'm confident the, the, of the infrastructure, the movement building organizations have. I'm confident that we have candidates that have good campaigns and professional campaigns because that's what it takes to. And we've seen it year after year in the last uh, in the last four years that we've won statewide because we won statewide in 2018, 2020, and this one is, is another one. So um, I, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying we have a really good chance of competing, but we need all of us. So thank you so much for letting me start so emotional. I, um, I haven't been able to talk frankly, and uh, this helped me a lot, thanks. Oh, good, good. You know, and I, I, I go ahead and too, because I know that there are some targeted districts where you think that you can flip. So go ahead without naming the names of candidates, but you know, yeah. if people want to help, then that's the best way to do it. Yes. So if we're looking at our map, we're, look, I am actually going <laughs> to, you, I, I know the names. Uh, okay. So we know that legislative district two is, is important. And also, for folks who are listening, you know, we, we've gotten a lot of pushback um, in terms of, of the, um, the single shot strategy. Uh, the single shot strategy uh, is what worked to change in the last decade, legislative district 28, legislative district 18. So, um, so when we saw the results of the uh, independent redistricting commission, we believe that with the numbers in front of us, 
we have a chance of getting majorities, ties majorities uh, in, in, in each of the, the chambers, but not staying where we are. We believe that we can increase if we do the single shot strategy, which means that we're, uh, we're, we're not running two, uh, two candidates in the house. And so in district two, uh, we, uh, we, that's, that's a targeted district. District four is a targeted district. District 13 is a targeted district. And each of these districts have one, one person in the house and have the Senator. And then I am spacing out. I'm, I'm trying to think 16 is the other district. And then we have to must, must, must flip district 20 at uh, the fifth district nine. So those are our five of the districts. Before I leave, I'm gonna put in the chat, I'm gonna go back and put in the chat every uh, LD that's a targeted district because uh, I know the names better than I know the numbers. All of us are learning the numbers as we go because we all know those have changed. So, um, so a lot of the work is going to be here in Maricopa County, uh, but we do have Pinal County uh, that has uh, that that will be a, a flippable district, and then there's also um, Yuma County that is also a tier. It's a tier two, uh, and because you all remember that one of the that last year we we actually ended up losing uh, one of our House uh, Democrats. Uh, to uh, Republicans because they did the single shot strategy in, in Yuma. So, uh, so that's a district that we want to ensure we, we protect uh, for, for the Senate because the people who are running for the House are unopposed, but we can't take the Senate for granted. So um, I, will, I will add numbers before I take off, but I'm open for questions. Do you have any other, anything else that I need to add? I, I mean, I think you really covered it, but I would love it if, if anybody out there uh, does have any questions or I've got my Facebook uh, open over here too to see if there's any questions there. Um, oh, and that's the, that you address that actually, uh, the, the, that thought you know that you just said that Democrats are not running enough candidates to win a majority in the house, even in the contested districts. The best we could hope for is a tied house because of the single candidate strategy. But the thing is, you know, when you're talking about uh, elections, you really have to know the win numbers and you really, uh, and, 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 and redistricting also makes that difficult because then you have yeah. to take these different precincts into consideration. And so, you know, I'm, I, I'm confident that, that this was looked at over and over and yes. over and over again. So I get it. I spoke with somebody the other day who's in uh, legislative district three and they feel frustrated because they, they don't have anybody to vote for, but it's like, well, you know, the person who would be running in that district would get clobbered. So it, while it is nice to have somebody to choose from on the ballot, um, and, and it is nice to have two people running for the house, we're just not quite there yet. And redistricting, I think, made it a little bit more difficult, you know? You, you put it perfectly, Dini, and that the other thing is that, let us not forget that this is also helping, like this we're, we're in for a, for a, the fight of our life right now that we are an official battleground state, something that we've been talking about for years that we already knew we had the potential of doing. We needed the investment. And right now we did, we, we got to that place really with, with not as much as investment in other, as other states. So uh, we are, are also continuing the foundation. Everything that it, this moment we're in right now is a foundation of, of, more, of more than a decade. So um, we, uh, the, 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 I know there's disagreements with a strategy, but yes, you're right. The reason of that strategy is solely based on the numbers that we have. And so the, the risk, the huge risk was if you run two candidates, you could lose two seats. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we at least uh, win one and continue to build just like 28 legislative, the old 28 did in, in the last decade and uh, District 18. Yeah, and so uh, Mary, Mary Ganapol, who's actually one of our uh, board members with Secular AZ, she says you can always help a neighboring LD. So if you are in one of those districts where you don't feel like you have a representation that supports secular government uh, and the other things that you value, 
you know, if you are in three, you can go to a neighboring district and support somebody else because we really do, you know, the, the most effective way to uh, change our legislature and to get people out to, to vote is really knocking on doors. So there, you know, there's lots of opportunities in these targeted districts. So even if you don't have anybody to vote for, you can go somewhere else. And yes, Representative Ligori says, great point, Mary. So is there anything you want to close out with, Raquel? <laughs> And then up and up the ballot and down the ballot, right? That this year we're really talking about down the ballot uh, with the initiatives that will be on the ballot. Hopefully uh, by July, there's enough signatures to get the fair elections, uh, the Arizonans for fair elections on the ballot, which will be critical, which will be critical because um, we have seen the attacks at our state legislature, um, uh, you know, left and right, right? The, the, we, we know how the early voting list was attacked last year. We know that they're wanting more ID. So getting that initiative on the ballot is critical. The final push is this month. And so I, I do think that that helps us with mobilizing our base because the average voter might not be thinking about voter suppression, right? Everybody's thinking about, I'm paying $6 at a gas pump, how expensive bread is, uh, but our base is paying attention at the consequence of these attacks on, on voting rights. So uh, I think that helps us motivate people. And, and like, so if you don't have an LD person that the, you're, 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 you're uh, a candidate, there's like, there is all the way down the ballot, we'll, we'll have initiatives to all the way to the top, we'll, we'll have Mark Kelly. And in between that, we have school board members who are taking up this challenge that's like at a moment where I'm just amazed at, at, at like school, bo school board members running because the attacks that we're seeing at the state legislature don't even compare to what some of these uh, school board members are experiencing. Uh, you'll, we, uh, we have, uh, the opportunity for the corporation commission again just like the, the the legislature we're only one seat away from majority there so it's the re-elected sandra kennedy re-elect uh, and electing uh lauren kuby uh will be will be amazing and i i think like this moment in time where we're fighting for climate justice and the is it's we can't think of better but better people to have in that commission so we I'm challenging people when we say like there's nothing exciting on the ballot. There is. There's ton of opportunities, and and uh, we need we need to echo it. We need a, a collective. We just need to echo this that we have to do it, and uh, it can't just be one person. We need to start with a sisa puede attitude. Todo this moment is like it's hard. <laughs> we might cry while as we're talking, like I just did today. today. But uh, but we have to keep going, even if we're tired, and we have to believe that si se puede, because at the end of the day, that is what got us to become the state we're in to compete. Well, very well said, and thank you uh, so much for taking time. I know this was last minute for you as well, so. Um, go back to whatever work you're doing or just hug your kid a little bit. I know. <laughs> yeah. He was All letting right. me hug him. I'll tell you, sure. He's like, because he doesn't let me hug him, but he graduated kindergarten. So I'm just hugging him and he thinks it's because of the graduation. He doesn't know the reasons yet. Yeah. yeah. All well, right. He's Thanks. a cutie pie. Yes. Thank you so much, Senator. Bye-bye. Bye. And so now uh, uh, Representative Sarah Ligori uh, was also kind enough to join us today. It was really such a terrible day on uh, Wednesday, you know, after the news of the shooting. And, and you didn't hear what we had been talking about, uh, Senator Tehran and I, but, uh, you know, we were talking about the shooting and, and the, the conversation in the Senate was reprehensible. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Rick Gray said that it was because um, of atheists and, you know, people without faith or non-theists, um, and then said what we need is more prayer in school, and Senator Townsend said we need to arm teachers, and I found that to just be the epitome of hypocrisy, because at almost the same time in the House, you all were debating SB 1412. So Townsend 
trust teachers. And, and it was the one time that I've ever heard Senator Townsend say that we need to increase funding, but she said we need to increase funding for security measures. So she doesn't want to increase funding for teacher pay for smaller class sizes, but you know, to arm our teachers and to hire more security guards. And then after that conversation yesterday, we learned that the police stood outside for 40 minutes or an hour, right? Like that, that the SRO, the guy went right past him. He was wearing a bulletproof vest. So again, the hypocrisy. So let's talk a little bit about 1412 because that was also a, a pretty reprehensible display of hypocrisy and false accusations. So if you wanna maybe, first of all, just introduce yourself, who you, know, who you currently represent and, and, and then we can get on with it. Sure, perfect. I know it was a, a very big week, a very hard week, a very emotional week. And I think that it's probably the third in a row we've had after the Roe v. Wade. And and so I'm I'm really hoping like all the, the tears and the emotions are starting to really chip away at some of this um, illusion that the majority party has a hold on people that this is a party that's doing something for you and you want them to represent. And then when we sit back and kind of everything is raw and we see it for what it is with, um, you know, the attack on reproductive rights and gun violence and continuation of pushing teachers out of their classrooms. Um, th this is what it is. This, this is where we're legislating from. So um, my name is uh, Representative Sarah Liguori. I was um, part of LD28. So uh, I sit with Miss Kelly Butler and Senator Christine Marsh. I'm now part of the new LD5. So like the, the central urban core um, of Phoenix. And uh, I, I sit now with Dr. Shaw, Representative Longden and Senator Alston. So there's a lot of us in LD5. Um, I, this week was, yeah, it was interesting. And, uh, you know, just for those that didn't tune in and it's must not watch TV, um, we, the Democrats held down, I, I don't know what the exact time was. I want to say it felt like two, two and a half hours of just back and forth discussion um, of why we do not support SB 1412. And I had a constituent reach out to me and they were like, well, did you have people from various backgrounds, you know, chime in? And I said, you know, uh, there is a diverse group of Dems that spoke up. Um, there was one, one Republican that spoke for the bill. Um, so, and I think that that's very telling. And it was, you know, an, an older white man. And you can imagine, you know, what he said, but I think that that's very telling. And at one point, Leader Bolding, they were trying to kick teachers out um, of the balcony. Um, we've had charter school teachers, private school teachers come down and literally hoot and holler in the background as bills that, that um, supported them were passing the floor and legislators clapping and videoing, you know, the teachers up there. And, you know, the second that, you know, I think it was Save Our Schools, someone said something or clapped, they tried to shut them down make them sit down. And then when they wouldn't sit down because they're not, they don't have to, they threatened to um, kick them out. So they tried to clear the gallery. And we as Democrats and leader Bolding said, you know, don't bring bills to the floor that you can't defend. And they had no defense for it. No defense. There was probably myself included, Rep Schwiebert, Rep Bolding, Rep Epstein, Rep Butler, Rep Pollock, Rep Cano. You know, there was just so many of us that spoke in opposition of it. Um, for hours. And then there was one Republican that was able to speak to why he was, you know, supporting it. And, Go ahead, and, Jeannie. And also, you know, you just said a bunch of names, Rep Schwiebert, um, uh, Rep Bolding was a teacher at one point, uh, Rep Pollock, you know, teacher. I think there's one of the other uh, males that you just mentioned too, I think had had a stint as a teacher. There's so many teachers in the legislature, both the House and the Senate, who disapprove of these bills, who oppose these bills. And I mean, even, even in the education uh, committee hearing, and I know that's not your committee, but um, uh, I recall uh, one of the bills that was being discussed, and I think it was Representative Hernandez who said, well, what educational organizations did you consult with? 
You know, I'm, I'm curious as to why you think this is an issue and what did the uh, Superintendents Association say? What did the Arizona School Board Association say? What did the AEA or AFT or anybody, anybody who knows anything, but no, it was actually, um, I mean, it was put together by uh, some, a group that's actually recognized as like a hate group, I think. So yeah. <laughs> that is infuriating. Anyway, so yeah, I, I saw that debate. Um, and, and, and also you, you mentioned Rep Schwiebert too. She was interrupted, mm -hmm. I think three times. And at one point, one of the representatives said, I want her sat down. And to me that, I think it was Hoffman who said that, that along with the 15 week abortion ban that every Republican voted for, just really, it was like, this is what he thinks of me as a human being that I am a second class citizen and I need to be sat down. I was outraged. I smile because, you know, I laugh. It's, it's very, it's very telling. Um, bringing a bill they can't defend, um, behaving in a very shameful manner as we try to push back with very, very legitimate points. And it's just, it's like, just because you don't want to hear it doesn't mean that we have to, um, you do what you want. And so it, I think that that day was very telling. I'm very proud, so proud. Went home last night. It was a hard night. It was a hard day, but I went home last night, that night, and I just felt so proud of everyone that spoke up and then um, pushed back. And like, we lost that battle and um, we lose a lot of battles, but I'm very proud of, you know, working with my colleagues and each of the points we brought up were not only 100% valid, but very unique and different perspectives. And so I love when we can all come together. I am, I am not a teacher. I spoke from being a mom. And part of the, the things that I talked about were part of the reasons that got me involved with local politics. So I don't like this conservative extremism, these narrative and these culture wars, you know, now we're, we're legislating from. And not only is it not right, but I also spoke to the fact of we are wasting dozens upon dozens of hours on these bills when homeless families are building tent encampments a stone's throw away from the Capitol door. I came down to serve and I didn't come down to serve in this capacity. And so it's it's very frustrating on multiple fronts. And I think it's part of the, it's just the underlying theme of this call today of why we need to get people elected that are actually gonna go down and do the work um, and, and expect, you know, accept nothing less. Well, and, you know, and our members are, you know, we have, we have all kinds of speakers who come in and, you know, we had, uh, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin for our secular summit in December. We've had Andrew Seidel in the past who used to be with Freedom From Religion Foundation. Now he's with Americans United for the separation of church and state. Or wait, was he with American Atheist? Anyway, he's, you know, he's an attorney and an author. And as he says on many, many occasions, and I encourage you to follow him on Twitter uh, because he really drops a lot of knowledge on Twitter. But you know, white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to our democracy. Yeah. We've seen the chipping away of that, that wall that's supposed to separate. Thank you. It's FFRF now with American Humanist Association. Okay. Um, but uh, we've, we've just seen this wall that's supposed to be separating church and state get chipped away with, with lawsuits. And now when we look at SCOTUS, so, you know, because we're, we're always careful here to say, well, we're a nonpartisan organization. So we're not supporting candidates. We're supporting ideas and, mm -hmm. and values. And so the people that typically share our values at this point are, are Democrats. I did see, however, that in, in one of the Western states, there was a atheist libertarian who was recently elected. So all you know, right. <laughs> the, or atheist, maybe he was even Republican. He may have even been Republican. Yeah. So, and I know that there are people um, who likely want to keep that separation, but we're, I, I, all I'm seeing right now is that extremist behavior coming mm -hmm. out of our legislature, out of Congress. It's, it's what it is, you know? Yeah. And, and I, and I spoke to this on CRT and I spoke to this, um, on, on 1412. And then I spoke to this with gun violence and then also with the abortion ban is it's all tied to the same thing. It's all, it's all white su supremacy and it's all control. And then it's all Fox News. And I have no problem saying that out loud because it's just, it's all propaganda 
And these are the three, you know, fast lanes they've decided to attack on. And we should not be legislating from that, from that arena. And the people don't want it. Um, it's not popular opinion at the very, at the very least. And so we need to be beholden to be doing better um, for the, for the people of the state. So I'm curious, um, were the, you know, we already know too, like how few of the bills that are introduced by Democrats actually make it even in, into a committee hearing. Um, were there any bills that you uh, had hoped to put forward this year that, that you crafted that, that just didn't even get heard? Yeah, well, you know, this was my first session, so I, I wasn't trying to shoot for the moon on anything. I had one personal, you know, passion bill, and then I, I introduced four bills. Um, I had two that got, you know, out and into committee. Um, one was a consumer, um, you know, predatory lending protection, consumer finance reform. Um, I, I introduced the Stop Dark Money campaign finance reform bill, and then I had a rainwater harvesting bill um, because water has been a, a huge issue to me, water and affordable housing mm -hmm. on top of pushing back against the extremism. Um, my rainwater harvesting bill has had life. It, it got life through a striker in the Senate. It's gotten bipartisan support. I'm, I'm working actively on it. It's been uh, because it has a million dollar appropriation to it. Um, and what it is, it's a, a rebate program so people can get up to $2,000 to install rainwater tanks. Um, it's, it's tied in with the budget. Um, and it's either tied in with the budget or it's tied in with the new water infrastructure um, plan that uh, Governor Ducey is, is pushing. So that one has, has continued life and I, ho I hope it gets across the finish line, maybe now not so much as a bill, but as part of the budget where we can get this money and this program started before the monsoon start. We're gonna have a very wet summer, I read. Hooray, we need it, mm -hmm. thank God. Not thank God. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> in the secular version of that. Um, but I'm hoping that we can get you know this money out to the people of Arizona that wanna start changing their landscaping and collecting their rainwater as part of a mini solution um, to this water crisis of just offsetting some of our outdoor landscaping use of water. Well, that that's good. That's really nice to yeah. hear that every once in a while, because I know that I think that, well, Christine Marsh, Senator Marsh had a bill that was about um, fentanyl, uh, yeah. you know, because, of course, tragically, her son passed away a few years ago. And so that was a passion project of hers, too. And that one got some bipartisan support. Um, you know, I think there was something about regulating fireworks. <laughs> so, I mean, they're regulating fireworks. Yeah. They're not earth shattering and perhaps not no. the things that we need desperately, but at least there, there are some bright spots where things happen. And I would say, you know, the fentanyl and, and water are, would fit that desperately category too, yeah. but yeah. it's just, it's very unfortunate. I, I would like to, in, in being a freshman legislature, seeing this in action and I co-sponsored so many wonderful wonderful bills like paid family leave, child care, rental assistance. Like there are so many wonderful democratic bills that don't see the light of day and it is by design. So there's there's two options to get around that. One, uh, Representative Fillmore becomes Speaker of the House because he has pledged to let every bill get heard that's introduced. So that's one. Two, we just flip the legislature and we get more Democrats elected. And then we, if we're in the majority party, then we are allowed to dictate what bills get heard. So um, you choose which one you'd like to have happen. Um, and we are, you know, this is what we're fighting for because there's so many good pieces of legislation and voices that are muffled and great legislators bringing forward great policy. Um, and no one gets to hear about them or see them or... Um, be supported by them because they don't get the light of day. Right. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I I did listen, but I I, I lost my breath just a little I know. bit when I, I imagined know. Fillmore I as the Speaker of the House. Um, <laughs> I said that on purpose. <laughs> oh, well, I'm I'm really really shocked. First of all, that um, that uh, he would. Be, I I just can't imagine. I, I'm really shocked that he says that he would hear every bill. He'd hear every bill. I find that really hard to believe. I mean, I guess that would be the way to tolerate all of his mannerisms <laughs> and the things that come out of his mouth. But I like the second option better of actually, of actually maybe. So that you know, that's another good question. What happens if there is a tie in the legislature? Are there 
dual speakers of the house? If it's an even split, how does that work? That might be above my pay grade. I don't <laughs> actually have the answer for that. And it's a beautiful scenario to figure out. I don't know how that they, I don't know how that they would do that, but I'm going to put some calls out to figure that out. Yeah. Cause I never really thought about that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I, I would much rather see somebody else there who could maybe temper <laughs> Phil Moore. Um, but anyway, well, and and who knows? There, I, I almost, I have this strange, you know, I know that there's so many long shots because there are still people who are running in very red districts who don't have a chance. And I, and I do appreciate those people who do that because they're just so frustrated, you know? Like, I know that there's a gentleman that's running and, um, you know, Wendy Rogers district, just because she's so crazy and hateful towards everybody and mm -hmm. dangerous, downright dangerous, mm -hmm. um, that he's like, fine, whatever, I'm just going to do it, you know, and good for yeah. him, even though he likely doesn't have a chance at all uh, to vote. Um, it's but, a great way, though, it's a great way for people that, that disagree, I, you know, like, there's also even if it's just at the very level of being able to find like-minded people like you in those districts and being able to vent and talk and plan and, and, you know, get gather around each other to say, we don't like what's going on. And, you know, we're all united in this. So I, I think that there is some beauty to that. Um, and it should be, because it's at the very least, it'll bring those communities of like-minded people together to push back. It's true. Yeah. Occasionally I will go to the Prescott individual, indivisible, um, gathering uh and then there's another one uh, whatever something progressive uh organizing round table and it's for like north rural arizona um i recall too back in 2020 um uh, legislative district 25 which is mesa uh now it's been split into two nine and ten uh ten being much more conservative and nine you know we have a really good shot there mm -hmm. um but when when you find your people like LD25 was one of my favorite LDs just because they were so energized because it was like oh finally look there's other people here like me in yeah. this community yeah community yeah mm -hmm. it's finding those people in those communities and just feeling like you're not alone sometimes that's sometimes that's all we need yeah so do you happen to know I know that they just posted um uh, today about what's going to be on the calendar for um, Tuesday. So is there anything that you feel like our members would, would need to know about? I, I mean, it's so sparse whenever you all meet. It is. And you know what? I, I came straight from canvassing. That's why I'm so sweaty um, <laughs> that I haven't actually looked at. I didn't know that they posted Tuesday's calendar yet. So I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. Um, it's a, we're in a weird phase right now. Um, there is animosity on, you know, on both sides of the caucus of what's going on with the budget discussions. And it's a lot of it is rightfully so, you know, gas is so high and people travel very far and they're getting frustrated of being pulled into work when we only vote on one to three um, very, you know, bipartisan supported bills, and they might be driving an hour, two hours, four hours to get there. So everyone is becoming very disgruntled, and we don't seem to be moving the ball forward anywhere with these budget discussions. So as the weeks drag on, um, I, I keep saying to each week, I, I can't wait to see what next week brings. I'm curious what next week brings. I haven't looked at the calendar of, of what they've posted. Um, it's usually telling if they plan to have all their members there or not on the Republican side by what bills they bring. So there's been a lot of very softball. They don't need the notes. They don't need the votes. Um, Wednesday was, you know, they knew they'd have, they needed the votes for the bills that we saw Wednesday. There was a lot of voter suppression bills and this uh, CRT bill. Um, so you can usually tell on the calendar on, on if the majority is planning on showing up that any given day of that week. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say, at least though, in the Senate, uh, a lot of the voter bills um, that came through the Senate this week uh, did not pass. Mm -hmm. So there's there is some good news on that front. I wrote them down actually. Yeah. Um, Forty three or twenty three seventy eight, uh, twenty two thirty eight, and twenty six o two, and those are in this order. Um, something about election lawsuits, um, the ballot boxes, boxes that yeah. one, that one failed. So that's good news, especially for rural districts. I mean, some of these, 
Oh, don't get me started. Um, 2602 had to do with emergency voting centers. So that one failed. And another good news thing that happened this week, and this is the second time that this one um, has been retained. And that one is 2495, the one that would not allow any mention of sex unless it was uh, early American literature or classics. So that one to me um, being held twice now, I'm hopeful that you know somebody like maybe Senator Paul Boyer is going to say, "I teach government and civics." You know, I, I can't. You know, so who knows? Make because every once in a while, they'll have a moment of sanity. Sanity. There's a mm -hmm. there's a couple in the Senate, maybe one in the House. You know, um, then there was one more that I wanted to uh, talk about. Oh yeah, that's. I see now looking at this calendar that the HB 2010, which is the one about homeowners flags, I know that our head of legal, Diane Post, had some reservations about that because of you know, the, the, religious, the religiosity of some of these flags. And yeah. so um, that's one that we're keeping our eye on as well. Yeah, I think we just maybe caucused that recently. And I remember we heard that very early on in government and elections. There was a yeah. lot of homeowner bills this year to flags and signage and, and we look through the lens that I think Secular AZ does of, are we opening this window for one specific entity or are, are we trying to close out other people from expressing what they might want to? And so I think uh, as, a, as a Dem, the Dems in the committee, um, you know, supported the stances of, of Secular AZ of not wanting to exclude um, anyone based on whatever religion or or flag they wanted to fly or show support for mm -hmm. well and speaking of flags the uh, uh, mary gannapol again uh says in the chat that the appeal to heaven flag finally came down so that is good news and um you know we'll also be waiting to see what happens with this scotus and this particular supreme court does not really inspire a lot of hope so We've got some really, really, really important cases um, happening here in the next month or so that we'll be keeping a really close eye on. So yeah, it's um, a big year. Yep. Well, I, uh, you know, I really appreciate you again for you as well as Senator Turan. This was a bit of a short notice thing. Um, Anytime. And yeah, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your voice down there. And I hope that you have a restful holiday weekend and that goes for everybody. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to jump on these calls and I, the feeling is mutual. I appreciate all of the work that you guys are doing out in the communities and in these districts and paying attention to these super important issues. So thank you. Right on. All right. Well, until next week, everybody, actually, wait, I, uh, we have some events. I've got to uh give some of these events we have um let's see uh chrissy stroop uh she grew up in a right-wing evangelical uh in the thick of the culture wars now incisive critic of the christian right she is another fantastic person to follow on twitter she talks a lot about her indoctrination i always think it's funny that they talk about teachers indoctrinating this woman was seriously indoctrinated in a highly conservative evangelical church growing up. And so her take on things is uh, really, uh, really fascinating and really informative. There are some other events with the Humanist Society of uh, Greater Phoenix. And we are, uh, we just had our second uh, school board candidate forum um, with Peoria Unified. We had one candidate join us. We did Chandler. I saw that uh, Patty Serrano is actually on this call today and she participated in our Chandler Unified uh, event. We also have Scottsdale coming up and that is June 6th. Um, then we also have, we do have somebody coming from the ACLU too, right, Lindsay? Am I missing it? Yeah, the Scottsdale Unified uh, there it is. candidate forum is on June 8th. And then mm -hmm. we're going to be hearing from Heather Weaver, who's the senior staff attorney at ACLU. And she's going to be talking about the SCOTUS case, Kennedy versus Bremerton, which was the football coach in the praying. So that should be really yeah. interesting. Yeah, we've got some. Yeah, so we've got great programming coming up. We're going to keep it going. Um, we're looking into possibly doing some live events coming up. We've done some tabling. So if you want to get involved with Secular AZ, you can go to our website, secularaz.org. Um, we love getting new members. We love when people like to donate money to us. Uh, we love having volunteers. 
And maybe if you want to consider joining our board at some point, we would love to have somebody with uh, whatever kind of skills you might have uh, that you can bring to our board, that you can bring to our committees. We would love to have you. So now we're really going to say goodbye. So goodbye, Representative uh, Ligori. It was nice of you to join us. And I appreciate everybody for coming on today. Take care.